welcome um, to uh, October's uh, EASA Animal Welfare webinar. Um, first off, I really hope that you enjoyed the uh, the conference if you were at it um, earlier this month and hope you've all recovered from being at the conference. Um, my name's uh, Dr. Ellen Williams. And I'm going to be hosting this webinar today. Um, a little bit of housekeeping information before we begin. Um, you're very welcome to have your videos on, but please stay on mute until you're asked to um, contribute to anything. Um, make sure you've got your chat function turned on because Marike will be asking you for some to drop some um, feedback into the chat as we go along. The session today is going to be about 45 minute presentation and then there's going to be time for questions at the end. So um, if you could send me your questions via a direct message and then I will group those together and then we'll invite you to either come on and speak at the end and ask your question uh, or um, you can just ask me to ask it on your behalf. Uh, just in case there's any technical problems, uh, fabulous tech support today is cell binding. So um, cell, I will drop cells um, details into the chat in a moment. And if you do have any problems, then please do just drop her an email and she will get you back in. OK, so um, enough with that. On with the, the most important bit. I'm absolutely delighted today to introduce uh, Dr. Marike Cassia Gartner. Um, she is the Director of Animal Welfare at Zoo Atlanta, and she's really spearheaded the zoo's animal welfare programme. This programme's included lots of different things. There's been assessments on animals, there's been welfare research across species, there's been training, and there's been looking at kind of how did they integrate welfare across the zoo. Um, Marike chairs Zoo Atlanta's Animal Welfare Committee. Uh, she's the vice chair of the Scientific Research Committee, and she's a member of the Behavioural Management and Diversity, Equity, Accessibility and Inclusion Committees. Um, she is a member of the AZA's Animal Welfare Committee and the Behavioural Scientific Advisory Group, and is on the editorial board of the Springer's Animal Welfare Series. So really delighted to have you here today, Marike. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're, Marike is going to be talking to us today about deconstructing choice and control. And as I said, there are some audience participation bits, so please um, get your chat ready for those as we go through. Thank you, Marike. Over to you. Hi. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here and talking a little bit more about um, choice and control. Um, if you were at the conference, I talked a little bit about control there. Um, and now I'm going to be delving a little bit deeper into um, both aspects of this, um, this, uh, these pillars of animal welfare. Oops, that's not working. Sorry, hold on one sec. Sorry, I seem to have lost control. There we go. Okay, um, so why focus on choice and control? Um, as we all know, the four years a very long time ago, but it really started us um, to understand how can we really help animals in human care? And that's over time, right? And so we still talk a bit about the aspects that are similar to that in um, the five opportunities to thrive. And of course, there's other um, frameworks as well, um, but this is one that I like to focus on um, for obvious reasons. So, you know, well-balanced ba diet is something that we talk about in all these frameworks, right? We have to eat right. Um, the opportunity to self-maintain, again, something we talk about in basically all of these frameworks. Um, the opportunity for optimal health. And here um, we should be talking about both physical and mental health. The uh, opportunity to express species specific behavior. And then quite clearly, the reason I like this framework is this opportunity for choice and control, right? And these are opportunities to thrive. So the implication here that choice and control are important for thriving. So when we talk about pillars of animal welfare, everyone who studies animal welfare has heard about choice and control. These two, two words um, are buzzwords. Uh, we don't, in fact, separate them often when we talk about them. Though you often hear um, if you or talk, you'll often hear people saying choice and control. Well, Control. There are a lot of choice, even when both terms are being used. And we need to stop doing that. We need to separate these two out and discuss them as two separate entities. They are related, but we need to think about them separately as well as together. 
So choice is something we're working on, right? We talk about it. We generally understand what it means, but we aren't there yet. We don't really understand a lot of the mechanisms there. We can define it too simplistically. We need to think about giving our animals more choices to increase their well-being. Now, control is something we generally, generally are not working on. We don't understand the definition, but it is integral to well-being. And again, we often say choice and control as if it's one word, right? But we're usually only talking about choice. So now I had this lovely little word cloud that unfortunately I can't get working for you guys to see. So what I'd like you to do instead is to just put in the chat what you think choice is. And for some reason I cannot see the chat again, even though I could before. Um, so actually it'd be great because I can't see the chat. Sorry about my technology issues here. If you guys could just yell, uh, oh, there it goes. Hold on, maybe I can see it now. I can't see it. Um, if you guys could just um, unmute and shout out what you think it is, or if the organizers could just read out what people are saying in the chat, that would also be helpful. So how do you define choice? We've got lots coming through. Um, hopefully some people shout some out, but basically we've got having options, selecting among options, multiple options, degrees of freedom, have the possibility to choose between those options, uh, autonomy, uh, opportunity to choose between at least two different options, opportunity to make decisions, free will, two or more options with the ability to select one or more options, the freedom to select between different options, freedom to choose to abide own desires and needs, depends on offer, opportunity to learn, uh, I don't know if I missed one there, sorry, so select an option among other options, feel free to unmute if people want to unmute to, to shout some out as well, that's fine, you should be able to do that I think. to learn we've, we've slowed down for now but if anyone's got anything else then do drop it in the chat or oh, one more sorry depending environmental context okay great so that's actually really interesting right a lot of different things going into choice and what we believe choice is somebody said autonomy so that's really interesting um and let's go to our next um uh question here so now how would you define control and please again put it in the chat or feel free to shout it out okay here again, we go no oh sorry sorry go ahead Oh, um, knowing your behavior has outcomes, um, ability to manipulate the environment to fit your needs, the ability to say no, the power of handling, depends on who is the one in control, mm. not having the possibility to make mistakes. The extent to which you can impact your environment. Um, empowering, being able to get the outcomes you want in your environment or situation, power over your environment, okay great so um, a lot of people clearly do have some idea of what control is, um, but often you will hear people saying, what is control and how do I operationalize it, right? So let's go back to uh, choice first, uh, if I can get this to work now. Uh, here we go. Okay, so we'll focus on choice for a moment. So choice does just basically mean having options. And um, you will see some definitions in the literature that say 
having more than one option, right? Um, so I really want to delve into that. So, you know, having options, right? It does not necessarily indicate good welfare by itself, right? So we can make unhealthy choices. You know, some examples include what we eat, whether we go to the doctor regularly or not, whether we exercise or not. All of these are known to affect um, our physical and mental well-being, and yet we don't always make the choices that lead to optimal outcomes. And that is true of non-human as well. Um, we also have things like unconscious choice. Now, one could argue with the term unconscious, but this is um, the idea of fight or flight or freeze, for example, right? So choices that we're not even thinking about or consciously making. And then there's non-conscious choice as well. So we may be conscious for these choices, but we perceive things that we don't even know we perceive. We make choices based on a variety of inputs. Um, they could be past, present, current context, past context, right? So one study, and actually there's quite a bit of literature on this, um, used fMRI to look at, this is humans, to look at uh, human thought and brains and what lights up there. And they found that they could predict a choice people made 11 seconds before those people um, physically made that choice, right? So we have to think about how our body is working neurologically as well as physiologically um, when we're thinking about what is choice and how we want to use it to uh, increase welfare. So coming back to this idea of choice being more than one thing, if we only have two choices, is that enough? Now, many people argue no, um, including myself. So a good example of this is um, if you offered me broccoli or spinach, I would be very unhappy because I don't like either of those things. And so it's for me to have two things I don't want at all. Now, if you add an artichoke into that, so you can have broccoli or artichoke, now, I love artichoke, I'm down to one thing, because I don't like broccoli. But if you offered me artichoke and asparagus, both things I like, all of a sudden it's more of a choice again. So just simply, simply defining choices to choices being good for welfare is not enough. So in the animal context, if our choice is to walk away or to do a training, but we only get reinforced for the training. Is that truly a choice? And people have started to discuss this more and say, no, it's not. That's not truly a choice. Now, if our choice is to walk away or train and we get the same food item as reinforcement for walking away or training, are we truly there yet? There are other things going on here, right? So the interaction with our caretaker and the animal can also be re, uh, rewarding. It can also be not rewarding, right? So there's other context going on here. And when we define choice as only two things, or we add food items as the, you know, something that applies, we still have issues with choice and its relationship to welfare. Something, choice. And my answer is no. And I thought about this a lot. And I was delighted by this chapter by Melfi and Ward. Um, they published in 2020. Um, and part of the chapter has the subheading of choice and control. And I really would suggest everyone read this. And a really good point to take away from this is when humans dictate what is learned, there's limited opportunity for choice. So in the zoo world, we need animals to cooperate with us, right? We need to do, for instance, medical procedures. Um, the animals in these situations have limited choices. That's not ideal, but it's better than, for instance, widespread anesthesia, right? Because that has other consequences for the animals. So getting animals to participate in their care is important, but we can give animals choice in other scenarios that separate it from problematic com uh, confounds. So moving on to control, as some people said, um, control really is about driving choice, right? It's the power to direct events and behavior. So a good kind of um, comparison is um, a story, a little story I have. I was um, up in upstate New York in the middle of winter 
Um, and if any of you know, upstate New York in the middle of winter, it is very, very cold. And that year was particularly cold. And I was staying at an Airbnb and I had no control. But I was given a couple of kits and a and I can tell you that that was not quite enough. So I had the choices, right? And that was good. It was good to have choices better than nothing, but it was not ideal. I really wanted control over that thermostat because I could not warm up and I was really cold. So control was really more important there than the choices I was given. Now we do have published definitions of control um, that have been used for um, operationalizing um, control and being able to study it. So way back in 1997, um, and even before this, but we're talking about with animals um, specifically, um, this um, article published the difference in the likelihood of an event occurring depending on an animal's behavior, right? So the animal's behavior is what controls that event, that is control. And then more recently, the ability to predictably produce desired results right? So that we get an expected effect. And here we have that autonomy that someone mentioned earlier, right? This, this is related to autonomy. So we do have definitions of control in the literature that we can use to help us to start to look at this more carefully. Control is one of the most critical variables in psychological health and well-being. And we have known this a long time in humans. It makes sense, evolutionarily speaking, that this would be the same in non-human animals. And there have been studies that have shown that control may be more important than choice for, well, uh, for well-being. Um, and animals will choose control over preference. And there have been quite a few lab studies on this. Um, for instance, rats will turn on a very bright light that is noxious to them, um, that they don't like at all, because they have that control to turn it on if it was turned off they wanna turn it back on. Similarly with mice, they will turn off a running wheel that they have been shown to like running on if an experimenter turns it on so that they can have that control. And there's many other subjects showing that animals do prefer having this control just like we do. Now, if we have too little control over our lives and you can just think about yourselves as well, right? A lot of things can happen. <laughs> um, it can lead to anxiety, mood disorders like depression, eating disorders, substance abuse. All of these things have been tied to too little control in humans. However, too much control is also not necessarily a good thing. So while control is usually indicative of good welfare widespread, excessive control can lead to predictability or certainty. And we know that can negatively affect welfare, right? Um, and predictability can also be beneficial to welfare though, right? So a certain amount of predictability can be good. So the key is balance, really like most things. Um, one study showed that uncertainty in feeding schedule increases natural behavior. This was in chimpanzees. Um, but we've also seen in other studies that uncertainty can lead to anxiety. So again, that key is balance. And then in humans, the idea of a type A personality, right? Someone who wants to control everything um, can lead to an increased risk of heart disease, right? So it's not necessarily adaptive if we have too much of control as well. So we don't want to look at control alone. And this is like most welfare measures, right? Any animal welfare scientist will tell you, you can't take one measure and say, I know what this means for this animal. And it applies to everything. One of the really important things here is the idea of ind individual differences. So animals have personalities just like humans do, and they will choose things and want to control different things based on those personalities. So for example, um, just talking about myself, I was talking with a colleague about this concept and I was thinking, I would like to have control over every aspect of my life and it would make me really happy to, to have that. I don't wanna not control anything. And she said, oh no, not for me. She said, I have control over some parts of my life, but it'd be nice to not have control over all of it. Things and it makes sense that non-human also will want different things. So again, 
I'm not trying to exclude other measures when I say control is important, it's more important than choice, but this is not to exclude choice, right? And I'll talk about the relationship in a second. Predictability, other measures, all of these should be included when we're looking at this kind of holistic view of animals. The idea of the well-being of an animal has many different parts, just like it does for us. So now the reason we talk about choice and control as one word and we talk about it together all the time is because they are linked, right? Choice is often viewed as a way to exercise control. Um, and a couple of articles really point this out, this Leody et al. Now they're talking mostly about humans, although they talk about animals as well in this article, saying that to choose is to express preference and therefore to assert the self, right? So if you make a choice about something it shows part of who you are. And that conglomeration of those choices can be a picture of the self, All right? So each choice reinforces the perception of control. So these concepts are linked. And finally, choice is a main mechanism by which individuals can exert control over their control picture. Now the human literature has shown a lot of this, <laughs> um, right? So um, you hear words like agency, autonomy, self-determination. These are all considered fundamental psychological needs of humans. Again, if we're thinking evolutionarily speaking, it just makes sense that this would also be the case for non-human animals. So control is adaptive in human beings, right? For psychosocial functioning. We know well-being is related to longevity, just as an example, is related to a lot of other things as well. But if well-being is related to longevity and control is related to well-being, then it too will be related to healthier functioning and therefore be adaptive, right? And so many of these articles have showed control is related to well-being, it's related to physical health at least until a certain age. Um, it's an indicator of well-being and coping strategies mediate the relationship between locus of control and workplace well-being. There's a lot, a lot of literature on workplace well-being and locus of control in humans. There's a lot less literature on control. The little article came out in 1881 with Indian elephants. And um, what they did, they a shower um, because the elephants liked water, they liked to shower um, certain times of day. And so they didn't train them at all, right? They didn't train them to use this. They just showed them that if you pull the string that you could turn the shower. And they only showed a couple of the elephants this and then the rest learned just by watching. And what they found was that elephants did use the shower but they used it in different ways. So again, individual differences, right? Some used it to shower, uh, some used it to drink, and um, some used it to uh, just to use it, just turned it on, but didn't get in it or drink or anything like that. And then a couple of the elephants didn't really show any interest in using it at all. Um, one thing they did find here was that dominant elephants wouldn't let subordinates use it. So um, it was clearly a resource that they liked and felt was important. Um, but it's something to think about. I'll talk about that a little bit later when you're designing studies to um, add control to um, for, for zoo animals. Oops. Um, another study a little more recent was done with white-faced uh, sakis. Um, and again, this trained um, to uh, interact with any of this, right? So the whole point is to take out that kind of and get some sort of reward. Um, and they could play a number of videos. They could play a worm video, animal video, abstract art, or a forest video. Um, they chose the first two the most, which is interesting. That's worm and underwater. I'm not sure why. Um, and um, they actually liked the animal ones the least, which is also interesting. Um, there were novelty um, and habituation factors involved here, but having control over that video, playing the video, decreased scratching. And um, as you may know, scratching in uh, white-faced sakis can be um, an anxious behavior. 
Now, there's been a lot of research, or a lot more research, I should say, um, in labs than in zoos on control. Um, many of you will have heard of some of these older studies in the 60s and 70s about learned helplessness, right? So animals that are given control over um, being given a shock have actually better welfare and less stress than those that are just shocked, right? Um, and this is this idea of learned helplessness, right? That if they have no control at all, they basically just give up. Um, and a uh, kind of good, more modern example of this is on social media, you'll see tons and tons of pet videos to their pets. They're doing some challenge to their pet. They're dressing up their pet. And you see no behavioral reaction or any reaction from the pet at all, obviously not in all cases. Um, this is uh, showing learned helplessness, right? And so there are also physiological effects. So in addition to these effects of learned helplessness, um, a lack of community affects hormones, obviously, as well. Uh, in 2012, um, there was a marmoset study done, um, and they gave them um, supplemental light and heat. These two things were together, light and heat um, apparatus. Having that supplemental light and heat increased the marmoset's welfare, but having control over it gave them even better welfare, measurably better. So they um, had calmer activity patterns and they showed less scent marking as well. Um, in the same year, there was a study with macaques. And again, going back to the control over playing a video, um, uh, the macaques uh, spent more time in front of the video they can control as opposed to a video that just played. Um, interestingly, um, while they stayed longer in that zone when the when they had control, um, their abnormal behavior, it decreased overall, regardless of the session. So whether they had control or not. So that's kind of an interesting take on something that you would, I would expect that the abnormal behavior would decrease with control. In this case, it just decreased having that access. Um, so there have been a uh, a few articles now um, kind of behind, with the theory behind control that we can really use to understand control and start to design experiments that we can give our animals more control with. Um, it's such a complex concept and it's really hard to do in zoos, right? Because we, by the nature of zoos, have to have a certain amount of control. But even a little bit of control can increase well-being. And so instead of avoiding the concept, we really should be embracing it. So in 1997, we had Sandbrook and Buchanan Smith, and they're talking here about control and complexity and novel object enrichment. Uh, 2007, Bassett and Buchanan Smith talking about the link between predictability and control. In 2009, uh, Jason Waters wrote about learning theory and motivation and control, again, as it applies to enrichment. Um, I already mentioned this Leo Di et al. Um, article, which is, again, a lot about humans, but also about animals as well. And it's a literature review on the biological basis for the need for choice and control. Cohen Hoy in 2020 um, wrote about uh, tech using technology to increase well-being by providing opportunities for both choice and control. And finally, just recently, um, we had a review of control literature um, and clarification of terminology because people really struggle with that by England and Cronin, um, and that was in 2023. So how do we do this? <laughs> um, we really have to think very hard about how we define a control study for zoo animals. And one thing we have to understand is preferences, right? So you want to give an animal control over something that they they care about and that they're going to want to interact with. And you can do this in a number of ways. There's a number of things that can be affected um, by, by a control kind of intervention. So thinking about natural behavior, you know, this idea that elephants like water and like these showers that they get, um, that we often administer to them, giving them that control. Um, the idea of enrichment. So um, is there some sort of enrichment that they particularly like that they can now actually have control over? So something like, um, you know, we give them misters. At Zoo Atlanta, we give uh, misters in the uh, summer to our orangutans but they can't turn it on and off, okay? Something like that. Um, features of the habitat and their enclosure, um, 
things that they control. You can see in this photo, this, this button is built right into the enclosure, things like that, where they can um, change something about the habitat or enclosure that makes um, them have more control about either where they are or visitor relationships, things like that. And of course, personality, again, is always gonna play a role in this. Now, in the zoo situation, of course, we have to worry about safety. So not only do we need our animals to be physically safe, we need our keepers to be physically safe, and we need our visitors to be physically safe. So we have to think about that side of it when designing these studies. So we're not gonna give animals control over their shift doors or things like that, although that would be cool. Um, and maybe there's a way to do that. Um, we have to worry about dominance. So as I mentioned in that previous study, um, there were some dominance issues and maybe that's okay, but um, we just have to make sure we're aware of it and we know what the possible consequences could be when we're designing these studies. And once again, personality will always play a role in um, everything that we do. Um, next, husbandry protocols. So, you know, uh, Zoo Atlanta, you know, all of our zoos or many of our zoos, we're zoos. We need to open at a certain time. We need to have animals out on habitat so that visitors see them so they don't complain. Um, we need to um, get those animals the nutrition they need. They have to be fed, make sure that they're eating in certain ways, right? So there's so many things that we have to make sure are being done that we have to think about when we're giving animals control over whatever it is that we want to give them control over whether it's for an hour or the whole day or the, their entire lives. Um, and finally, we can use technology to do this. So we can not use technology as well. So the article with the elephants, the Indian elephants, you know, they just pulled on a rope and that started that shower. It could be as easy as that. Um, but we can also employ technology. There's motion centers, there's uh, sensors, sorry, there's buttons, you know, there's so many things we can add in that automates the process that can make it easier for us um, and therefore enriching for them. There's many ways we can get, go around doing this. Okay, so just one example here. This is um, Harley, uh, Golden Lion Tamarin. And you can see that there that he simply closed the door on his nest box. Now, uh, let me just see if I can get this to uh, play again. Okay. Just because it was so short. Now, choice would be having access to the next nest box, right? But here, Harley has control over the door, right? He can open it and he can close it. And that gives him control over a lot more. It gives him control over light because it's dark in there when he closes the door. It gives him control over temperature. It's a bit warmer in there when he closes that door. Um, he can get away from viewers that way, uh, visitors, sorry, um, if he closes that door. He can dampen noise if he closes that door. So you can see this tiny little thing that he just has control over this door gives him some options that can increase his well being. So control does not have to be a huge effort. It does not have to be a huge, they can open a door, they can, you know, we can get at this in little ways, we can chip away at it and try and really get at that bigger picture for them. All right, here we have Blaze. And I'm just going to stop, oops, stop the video for a second. Let me go back. So Blaze is an orangutan. And you can see there she has this little fountain. Now that's not actually a fountain. What that is, is her lixit, which is her where she gets water from, and how to drink. And how that works is she can just press down on it and she can drink from it. But what she figured out is if she puts a stick in there, a piece of straw, it'll just run continuously. And that makes her really happy. She loves it. So she'll fill her bucket with it. She'll just sit there and watch it, as you can see here. Um, and so she's actually giving her self-control here. We didn't do this. But what it did was it gave us some ideas of what she might want control over just by watching her behavior. So my colleague and I, uh, Dr. Aridia Pacheco, um, we are attempting to do a control study. There are very few out there. And so we're trying to do this and we're starting with our orangutans. We actually would like to do this with all our primates to start. And then who knows, we'd go on from there. So how does control affect orangutan behavior and their effective states? So what we're doing is we um, are starting by just collecting some baseline data. So behavioral observations, you know, it's the, easy way to really get it, what animals are, are thinking and feeling, right? Just behavioral observations. We're doing it indoors, on habitat. 
We're doing a personality assessment because as you might've guessed, I think personality is very important for every study we ever do. Um, we're doing a well-being assessment as well. Then we're doing a cognitive bias training. And if you don't know about cognitive bias, basically it is to test whether an animal is optimistic or pessimistic. Um, so we're doing this before we do any of the control um, testing. Then we're gonna be testing the animal. So we are planning on doing this both on habitat and inside. Um, we will continue our behavioral observations and then we'll do another cognitive bias test after to see if um, effective states have been changed. So what we're doing is we're going to give them uh, control over sound, water, and light. So the light is for overnight. So if you think about it, um, orangutans, just like us, tend to sleep at night. However, when keepers leave, they leave at five, six o'clock at night and they turn off the lights and they go home. Five, six o'clock at night is not normally when most people go to sleep. Um, and our orangutans don't either. Now, in the summer, light is coming into that building and they have light. But in the winter, it gets dark at three or four o'clock and it's dark pretty early. So we wanna give them the option to turn on a light. Do they want that light? And maybe they want it in the middle of the night too. I don't know. I turn on light sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, and that gives them some control over their lighting at night when normally it's just dark and they have no control over that. The water feature is based on Blaze, the orangutan I showed you before, but you know also other orangutans that we know really like uh, water. All, most of our orangutans seem to really enjoy interacting with water. So we're gonna do this on habitat, give them um, access to water, but having that control over so they can turn it on and off. Um, and then finally, um, a white noise machine. So our orangutans have a lot of noise going on. We have construction, just where their building is located. Um, there's also visitor noise. So we thought, I don't know, maybe they'd want a white noise machine. Um, some, some humans like that. I personally actually don't like that. So, you know, in differences, we'll see if they want to use that. But again, having that control, being able to turn that on and off. And our paradigm, we're using not those buttons, that's just a, a photo, button. so they're going to be able to press a button to turn something on and that will be control mechanism. So we're going to see if they even do it. Um, and then if they do it, under what circumstances, how long, all, the, all that sort of thing. And we hope to really see um, whether they, they want this interaction. Now, you know, this is going to be a limited number of orangutans, like any zoo study. And the other thing is that it's not good. Like most studies, it's not going to be definitive, right? They, these orangutans have not had these choices. Now they're going to be given these choices. It might not be salient to them. Right. They may be so used to their lives that this doesn't work out. I don't know. Um, we're hoping to see um, what happens. Basically, we're just kind of going to do it and see what happens. So we're, we're just trying something. Right. And this is what I hope to encourage. And this is kind of my takeaway here is let's start experimenting. Just start stuff. Try. It can be small. It can be big. Start giving our animals more control over their environment and thereby hopefully increasing their well-being. We can stop saying choice and control like it's one word, and we can really try and give them both things and do what we're supposed to do as, as we are obliged to do as people who take care of animals and human care is increase their well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marike. That was fabulous. Um, so we've got some questions coming through. Um, let me just go to um, Dave Powell, if you're happy to ask your question. Let's see if I can unmute you somehow. Morning or Thank good you. afternoon. Yeah, Marie, my question is about how we should talk about training now, because for decades we've said it's an opportunity for choice and control. But as you've pointed out, training is actually about bringing behavior under control, using reinforcers that animals like. So it's a manipulation of behavior. So I'm wondering if you guys are talking about training differently just in your vocabulary or when you talk about the benefits of training. Is there a way we should talk about it that's essentially maybe more honest or more correct from your perspective? 
Yes, I absolutely think that we should be kind of separating the idea of choice and control from training. As I mentioned earlier, training is something that is necessary and beneficial um, for our animals in human care, right? So when we're doing, um, let's say, taking blood pressure or looking at um, an ultrasound for a pregnant animal, it's better not to anesthetize them to do that for their health. But we should be being more honest about it and separating the two concepts. So we're doing this for their help. They may be participating in their care, but we're not talking about choice and control when we're talking about training. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing malicious or bad about saying that. They're just two separate concepts. And we both things are trying to get at the best lives for our animals and taking care of our animals, but they are separate ideas. Super, thank you. Um, I've just got one from somebody who can't ask. Um, how do you test, or how do you recommend testing if an animal is optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is cognitive bias testing. Um, so I can give a really quick example. Um, there is a literature out there. There's actually quite a lot of good information out there on, on, on the subject. Um, this has been some, done with a huge variety of animals, but basically um, a very simplified way of thinking about it is um, and we did this with parrots. So we did a visual concept. You could do any sort of sense. Um, but you show um, one cue. So in case we showed a black card to the parrot, we asked them to touch it. We showed them a white card. We asked them to touch a yellow object. Um, and then you say, so they understand what to do with a black card. They understand what to do with a white card. And then you show them a gray card. So it's called an ambiguous cue. And the test is what do they do when they see that? So if they're optimistic, oh, and I should say that, the, so let's say the black card is associated with a higher reinforcement and the white card is um, associated either with no reinforcement or a lesser one. So when they see the ambiguous cue, if they do the behavior associated with the higher reinforcement, that means they're optimistic. They think, oh, close enough, that's gonna get me the higher reinforcer. Or if they do the behavior associated with the low reinforcer, they think that's not anywhere near what, you know, the black card, I'm not going to get that. I might as well do um, the lesser behavior and get that lesser reinforcement. That's a really quick and dirty way of putting it, um, putting it, but you can read um, all about it. There's a lot of literature out there on that. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Jamie next, if you want to unmute Jamie. Hi, yeah, a really interesting talk. Um, I just had a question in the wild. So animals are motivated by things in their environment, like, um, competition, for example, um, to make choices that benefit things like survival and reproduction. Where do you think the motivation to make healthy choices comes from in captivity? Um, yes. So I do think that it, there, you know, there's going to be similarities there, of course, um, but then you have to add in other things. And so one of the things that um, could be motivating to an animal in captivity um, are their caretakers. And that's kind of where we get that confound in training there as well, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so they can be internally motivated, just like we can, this idea of locus of control. Um, but there might be external factors as well. Um, but they will have those internal, you know, they still want to eat, right? They want to be comfortable. Um, there's all those similar motivations. There just may be some added ones as well that are related to their relationships with humans, um, relationships to um, other animals as well. Super, thank you. Um, we'll go next to Alice. Great. Yeah. Um, well, first off, thank you very much. That's so interesting. <laughs> um, second, I think, well, it's funny that you mentioned the water thing, because like I've actually worked with a chimp that would do the same thing. And my question is, when you give choice on like environment, like that in control over your environment, how can you make sure that the control you give to one individual, for instance, I mean, in the group does not end up being act actually like detrimental to another individual, for instance, because like I'm thinking that we've had this chimp that would uh, play with the water like that and it would drive another one completely nuts. And so how do you find that balance between giving control and like the effect, the negative effect that it can have on the rest of the groups? That's really speaking in groups. Yeah, great question. We've thought a lot about this, of course. Um, so with the orangutans in light, we just had this picture in our head of our um, teenagers turning on this bright light, lighting up the whole 
you know, environment and the older orangutans wanting to sleep. And so, yes, you have to think about that. And it's not easy, right? So with orangutans, it's a little easier because they're semi-solitary. They're not kept um, alone, but they're kept in smaller groups. And so we're thinking in that case, we'll use a very small light. So it gives them some light, but it doesn't light up everyone else's um, uh, uh, enclosure if the other ones want to sleep. So yes, when it's a big group of animals, you have to think carefully about it. There Maybe there's a kill switch, right? So if you have, if you really have to, to do that, take control back, then that happens. Um, in the elephant study, they only gave them an hour of control um, a day. You know, so those dominance effects they saw didn't last. There was no lasting harm. Um, but there are so many ways that you can kind of intervene there or, you know, there's also appropriate challenges. So that dominance behavior was a natural behavior and no harm came to those other elephants. Probably OK for that short period of time. So maybe you limit the time. There's 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 ways of getting that at that. But it's very important to think about, yes, the other animals that might be affected by that. What do you say? This with solitary animals. <laughs> yeah, I guess balance really is key. Balance is key. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Um, got one more here. Um, so what about? Oh, well, first off, this very, this was a very interesting talk. Thank you. And um, what about species with lower cognitive abilities than, for example, primates or elephants? For example, is control as important for reptiles or amphibians, say, as? And how do we then offer those opportunities to them as well? Yeah, great question. So um, from what I can tell from the literature, I don't see why it would be any less important to them. Um, one of the reasons we started with orangutans is because we do understand more about orangutans. So if we can start to understand orangutans, then we can move on from there. Um, but the only way to get at this is to do these tests, right? To think about the concept and then do these experimental tests. So you know, how do we give control to reptile the same way we give control to an orangutan? Just maybe it's not a light in their case, right? Maybe it's a climbing structure um, that they can move or they have more options um, for that, right? So they can control uh, the heating, right? For reptiles, um, uh, uh, heating is much more important. So maybe they have the option to turn uh, a light on or off. Now with a lizard, that's easier, a snake, uh, maybe they can slide over something that triggers it, right? Or motion sensor. Um, so yes, we can we can test this in other animals as well, other than primates. Um, I don't know definitively, but I would think, again, evolutionarily speaking, it would be weird if control didn't affect them, at least similarly, if not in the same way. Mm -hmm. Fabulous, thank you. Um, I've got another one. If you've only got, um, so if you're sort of giving that control for sort of short periods of time, like say that example with the elephants, do do you see or have you seen or have you heard of animals sort of getting frustrated that that's only for a short period of time? Do they want it for longer? And on the other side, I guess, do you see sort of anticipation for it? And then is that or a good or a bad thing? Uh, yeah, that I mean, we don't know. Like, so that elephant was very little deep. It was just more of a kind of brief report. And I can absolutely see that happening. Frustration, we could see anticipatory behavior. These are all things that we should be measuring. And this is why we need more studies on control. So we can answer these questions and then figure out how to give animals more control without having, um, or at least trying to have, you know, lesser negative consequences for them. Um, giving, ideally, we give them control over things more than for just an hour. Um, but how do we deal with the other consequences of that? That's why we need to do more of this um, and figure it out. Fabulous, thank you. Um, related to um, control, actually, got another question here. Um, what's the kind of, what's the impact of this uh, on, sorry, effects, what's the impact of this on the social hierarchy? So if you're offering um, control to animals that are lower in the social hierarchy, have you then got possibilities for poor consequences, poor welfare consequences coming as a result of that? Um, yes. Yeah, so again, more testing needed. Um, but we did see that or they did see that with those elephants. Right. There was that dominance. Um, they didn't report anything um, hugely negative other than um, some of the other animals were uh, weren't. They didn't say they weren't able to use them, but that the dominant animals tried to stop them from using it. So, yes, you can imagine there could be negative consequences there. Um, again, more 
there's going to be those social interactions. There's going to be um, these, you know, dominance interactions. And we find out we have to test it. I can't answer that question because there's so few studies on this. And that's one of the reasons I keep talking about this as much as I can. Let's do these studies. Let's do more studies on control and figure out these questions, the answers to these questions. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of lots of scope for people to be doing more research. I just had one quick question, if that was OK. Um, if you don't do anything, so if, if, if you offer an animal those choices, those opportunities, and then they don't do anything. So say if your elephants, say if the elephants had not turned the shower on or whatever when it was offered, do we just assume that they they don't want to change their situation? Should we carry on offering those choices or do we think about offering other choices instead? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just because they don't use something, it, there there's many reasons why they may not use it, right? Maybe it's something that they don't want. Maybe it's personality. Um, like there were those two elephants who just didn't use it. Um, there are so many things. Maybe we designed the study wrong. Maybe we designed the apparatus wrong. Maybe they didn't like the pull function. Maybe they don't like to push a button. Um, you know, there's so many ways to look at it that we can't assume that the animal doesn't want uh, control. And we just look at our design first and make sure that what we're doing is answering a question and then something else. You know, maybe an orangutan wants to sleep the whole night, want that stupid life. That doesn't mean they don't want control over their lives. Now, Hopefully we can give them control over something that is beneficial to them. Um, if, you know, maybe, hopefully the only thing they don't want is to get out, right? Um, so I really, I mean, just showing, you know, that, that video of Harley, hopefully we can really give them things, even if it's a small thing um, that gives them control. And if it's not one thing, we try something else. We should never assume that what we're giving them is what is the answer, the only answer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and just a couple of, I think, I don't know if you can see the chat still or still not see the chat, but a couple of sort of responses to that as well is um, thoughts around the fact that the choice not to use it then is obviously a type of control. And um, absolutely. they've just highlighted that paper by um, with uh, Georgia Mason. Don't use it. Don't I assume Georgia Mason. Don't use it. Don't lose it. Uh, yeah. And um, discuss, discussing the benefits of offering those non-chosen options as well. Yeah. Um, fabulous. Thank you so much. I think we have, I think we've got to the end of the questions that I've seen in the chat. If anybody's got any, um, then please do hop on quickly and ask. Um, but if not, um, I'll I'll wrap up. I think we've um, we've certainly grilled you a lot there. Thank you so much for your time. I um, really appreciate it. It was a really fabulous webinar. And 